first I'll give you a little information about Mrs. Ms. Amy Becker. And she is from Virginia Beach, Virginia. And she went to West Virginia University to complete her undergraduate degree. She received her doctorate of audiology from Vanderbilt University in 2015 after an internship at the University of Virginia. She has been working with both adult and pediatric patients at Biden Medical Center since 2015. Her clinical interests include diagnostic testing, cochlear implants, pediatrics, and interprofessional collaboration. And we thank Mrs. Baker for joining us today. Mrs. McDermott is her coworker, and she is originally from New York and received her master's of audiology degree at Queens College. She has been working with adult and pediatric patients at Biden Medical Center since 2015 as well. Her clinical interests include student supervision, pediatrics, and hearing aids. So today we should get some information about audiology. And I hope that you have questions. She sent us a list of questions that I found quite interesting. So if you have that list and there's a question that you would like to have answered, please let them know. And at this time, I present to you Amy Becker and Sandy McDermott. Thank you all for having us this morning. Um, I hope that you can hear me okay and that you can see my screen because we did make a presentation for y'all. Um, I'm Amy and this is Sandra Good and morning. this is the Good first morning. time we've done Good a presentation morning. like this together so we're excited. We're going to kind of keep it an informal kind of conversation. Um, if y'all have questions you can either interject them, um, you can type them in the chat box or save them till the end whichever y'all prefer. All right, thank you. All right, so we can't really talk about hearing without first talking about the structure and the anatomy of the ear. Um, there's a lot more to the ear than just what you see on the side of somebody's head. That's really just part of the outer ear. Um, obviously your ear canal and then your eardrum begins your middle ear. If you've ever had a cold or sinus infection like I'm getting over, um, you could feel some pressure um, kind of built up behind your eardrum. Your ears feel really uncomfortable. Um, that kind of happens behind that eardrum area. And then your organ and your nerve of hearing comprises the inner ear and that sends all your sounds up to your brain um, where they're kind of interpreted. So again, there's kind of more that meets the eye to your ear and hearing loss can really occur at um, one or multiple points along this whole pathway. So that's kind of our job is to try to help figure out where it's coming from. Sometimes we need help from some from physicians. So there's a lot of things that can cause hearing loss. Sometimes they're hard to pinpoint, other times they're a little bit easier. As we get older, um, our hearing can definitely deteriorate. If we have a strong family history, like if your parents or your grandparents, aunts and uncles, if they all you know, just kind of went down the line of having trouble hearing as they got older, there's a chance that that person may develop hearing loss as well. Certain medical conditions or medication side effects can cause hearing loss. Sometimes it's temporary, sometimes it's permanent. Um, like I talked about the physical structure of the ear, sometimes babies are born with their ears not formed properly. Um, but for adults, there can be, like I said, like a blockage, there could be a buildup of fluid or pressure, excess earwax. Um, if you've had any trauma to your head or your ear, such as a car accident, skull fracture, or brain injury, that can contribute to how well or not well you're hearing. And then if you've been exposed to a lot of loud noise, so if you had a real noisy job, or if you um, shot off guns a lot without hearing protection, um, people who are in bands that don't protect their hearing and their ears properly, that can all, all of these things can contribute to hearing loss. And I just want to add that with exposure to loud noise, it doesn't have to be ex uh, long exposure over time. Um, even a single blast can do damage to the hearing that some of which may be temporary, but some of it can also be permanent. 
All right. So some side effects of hearing loss, um, besides just not being able to hear or understand what people are saying or not, you know, not hearing your TV or can't understand on your phone. Um, a lot of people kind of self-isolate from all their social functions, which everybody, I guess, has been doing recently because of COVID. Um, but prior to COVID, I've had people come in and say, I've stopped going to church and I don't go out to lunch anymore with my family because I just can't hear, can't understand what they're saying. It's embarrassing. It's hard to try to listen. Um, a lot of people come in complaining about tinnitus, which is ringing or buzzing, humming, any kind of sound in your ear when it's otherwise quiet around you. I've heard people call it like a, like a deaf tone. I feel like that's like a really old um, thing for people to call it. Um, your friends and family can be frustrated because they were having to repeat themselves or raise their voices. Um, and then a hot topic for researchers is that hearing loss um, may or may not contribute to cognitive decline. So people who have Alzheimer's disease or dementia, um, we don't know if hearing loss can speed that up or if it's just seen together with it, but that's something that people are looking into. Um, something to remember, and we'll kind of repeat this a couple times throughout the presentation. If this is the only takeaway that you get, it's important to know that louder sound does not always mean something's going to be more clear or that you're gonna understand something better. Um, people will come in and tell us, I have my TV all the way up to 50 and I still can't hear it. And what they really mean is they can't understand it. Um, and that's where audiologists come in and we can try to help you with making that a little bit better. So what are some treatments for hearing loss? Um, sometimes hearing loss is not really like treatable. A lot of times it's not fixable or curable. A lot of times it is permanent. Um, but we would recommend a medical evaluation with an ear, nose, and throat doctor. They can decide if you need any type of imaging, like an x-ray or a CAT scan or an MRI, to look deep inside your ears, kind of like that first picture I showed that you can't see just from the outside. Um, there might be surgery or medication that they can recommend for you. Um, like we mentioned um, about the loud noise that can damage your hearing, a lot of times that is permanent, like Sandra said, and the only way to protect your hearing from that is to wear hearing protection around loud noise. So the ear plugs or really the ear muffs that go on top of your ears um, are even better, or if you could use both at the same time, that's awesome. Um, and then getting evaluated or te your hearing tested by an audiologist to kind of see what you're working with in terms of how well or not well you're hearing and we can recommend amplification which is usually hearing aids but there are some other options as well um, we're going to talk about those a little bit further does anybody have any questions right now that they're dying to ask i have i have one okay i have tinnitus and it's, it's bothering me right now mm -hmm. i have been to your nose and throat specialist they have told me there's nothing really that they could that, that, that can be done okay have you had your hearing tested i have it's been a couple of years now i need to go back and get it done okay again but, um a lot of times like i said tinnitus is a side effect of some other type of hearing loss um and even if somebody has normal hearing with that ringing with the tinnitus that's really bothersome sometimes mm -hmm. um hearing aids programmed a real special way can help with that. So Sandra and I would love to see anybody for an appointment to talk about your options and to do some testing to see where anybody's at with their hearing. And our contact information is gonna be at the end as well. Okay. But there, I mean, the doctor was right. There's no like surgery or medicine or anything like that to make the tinnitus and the ringing go away completely, which is unfortunate. But there are some things that we can recommend to kind of help cover it up. There are also, I would just like to add, because I am bothered by tinnitus as well, mine is kind of a buzzing sound that's in my ear, both ears, and it's, um, it's, it's constant, but I find that if I am very tired or if I've had a lot of caffeine or if I have eaten a lot of sodium, that it makes it a lot worse. So sometimes you may want to experiment with, um, you know, dietary things to, to see whether or not it affects it in any way. Okay. Well, I just have it in, in the one ear at the moment. And it, it's periodic. 
but for the last couple of de- couple of days, it has been constant. Yeah, and it can change over time. So it can start out periodic and then become constant. It can change the pitch or the sound. Um, and I don't know that anybody would be able to pinpoint necessarily why that happens, um, but we would recommend that you come see us for a hearing test and c- kind of discuss your options that we can help you out with. I will do that, thank you. Yeah, any other questions before we move on? All right. Um, this is kind of hard to see. I can send this out as an email to Miss Rhodes so that she can pass it on to y'all. Um, but if you, it's kind of like a checklist of questions. And if you answer yes to one or multiple, it'd probably be a good idea to come in and get your hearing checked, um, even just as a baseline to establish where you're at right now. I have sent that to them. Okay, wonderful. Mm-hmm. All right, so Miss Sandra is going to talk a little bit about the services that we offer here in the audiology department at Biden. Okay, so the first thing um, when you come in for a hearing test, we're going to be asking you some some questions um, to see how long you've had the hearing loss, if there's been any recent change, things like that. We're going to be doing testing, um, not only to see where the very softest sound is that you're able to hear um, at different, different pitches, different tones, but we're also going to be doing a test where we're going to be asking you to repeat back words. As Amy had said before, um, a big consideration is not just um, how much hearing loss there is in terms of how loud sound has to be made before you're just able to hear it, but another very important aspect of it is ability to understand speech. And we have a test that, um, that looks at that where we ask you to repeat back words. We also do a test to make sure that we, of course, we look in the ears and we also do a test that looks at how the eardrums are moving. Sometimes if people have allergies or um, fluid buildup behind the ears, eardrum, then um, that will also affect the hearing and we have a test that looks at that. And if y'all, any of y'all have had a hearing test before, you probably remember listening for beeps and pressing a button or raising your hand because that's what everybody remembers from the test yes. anywhere that you've ever had it. Yes. <laughs> now, if you um, if it's determined that you have hearing loss and there isn't anything that can be done medically to make the the hearing uh, better, then one of the options would be would be hearing aids. Um, there are different types of hearing aids. Some are behind the ear. And um, of course, there's always a piece that goes in the ear, but the bulk of the hearing aid um, is behind the ear. That is by far the most popular style that we see um, currently. Uh, But some people do prefer to have a single unit that just goes in the ear, okay? Some people find that it's easier for them to just handle one piece versus having something that goes behind the ear and a little piece in the ear. It depends on the hearing loss. It depends on the amount of hearing loss that you have. Um, it may depend on the, your dexterity. Um, so there are a variety of different factors that would be discussed with you to determine what would be the best for you as far as the type of hearing aid and what your options are. A lot of the hearing aids now come with some um, really nice options as far as Bluetooth is concerned, where you can accept phone calls um, directly into the hearing aids. If you listen to podcasts or audiobooks, videos, that can all be um, going into your hearing aids directly, which is a really nice feature for that people really enjoy. There are accessories that can be purchased as well with hearing aids um, that can help with specific things. For instance, a a microphone that um, can be put on the table to allow other people's voices to be picked up and delivered directly into the hearing aids. There are TV adapters that can be purchased that would bring the sound of the TV directly to your hearing aids so that you can adjust the sound 
via your hearing aids without it making it louder for everybody else, but other people can also hear the TV. Um, so there are some nice accessories that can go along with the hearing aids as well. And over the last few years, the behind the ear hearing aids, um, a lot of them have an option now where you can have rechargeable batteries. So that's something that people really enjoy because they just get into the habit of taking out their hearing aid, cleaning it, putting it in the charger, and then they know the next day that they're gonna have a full battery charge for whatever they wanna do. Even if they use the Bluetooth a lot, that battery charge should last a full day. They don't have to worry about going somewhere um, and being in the middle of watching a movie and having having mm -hmm. to walk out of the movie theater to change the battery on their hearing aids. Or I've heard people in the past before rechargeable hearing aids, I had somebody come in and say, I was in the middle of a meeting with my lawyer who charges by like the minute and my hearing aid died and that, that was precious oh, money that, would be horrible. that I had to, to <laughs> you know, spend to just change the battery in my hearing aid. So yeah, rechargeability yeah. is wonderful. We like it too. Yes. <laughs> Any questions about that? I think we have some pictures. Maybe my computer, there we go. Pictures of some of what those hearing aids look like. Sorry, they're all men ears. <laughs> That's what Google <laughs> gave me. Okay. These are different styles. Um, you can see the one on the top left is a, an in the ear style. Um, that is a what we call a full shell in the ear style. There are styles that, that are smaller that don't fill up the whole top portion of the ear, um, but th that is one of the in the ear styles that is offered. On the top right, you have what is our most, I would say it's our most popular style hearing aid where the hearing aid is seated behind the ear, but if you look closely, you can see a very thin tube that um, is attached to something that goes in the ear, but it's when inserted properly and fit properly, it's something that is um, a lot of people don't even know that you're wearing a hearing aid because the only part that can be see really seen is the part that's behind the ear. Um, and for women that have long hair, you can't even you can't even tell that mm -hmm. a hearing aid is on. And if somebody is wearing glasses all the time, we can kind of match the color of the hearing aid to whatever the arm of the glasses is, and it just kind of looks like an extension of the glasses. So mm -hmm. they're really able to be very invisible. In some cases, um, that style is is not an option, and a more traditional behind the ear hearing aid um, is what we need to go with, and that is shown on the bottom. Um, the difference between the top right and the, and the bottom one is that instead of having a very thin tube with something that goes in the ear that can't really be seen, you have a thicker tube attached to a custom made ear mold. So on that bottom piece, um, ear impressions were made and a custom ear mold was made to fit that ear. Um, and there are different reasons why one style may be chosen over the other, and that's something that would be discussed um, as part of the hearing test and a consultation immediately following um, to determine what would be most suitable for you. Mm -hmm. well, now, with the one that's in the ear, the top left, is there a smaller one? There is a smaller one right now. The in the ones that go in the ear um, do not have rechargeable options, and depending on the style that you, that you want, how small you get, the size of your ear, and the shape of the ear, the in the ear models may not always be able to accommodate some of that Bluetooth connectivity that we spoke about earlier. So. Um, it depends not only on the style of the aid, but it also depends on the shape of and the size of the ear that's being fit. Okay. Whereas with the um, behind the ear hearing aids, that's not an option. There's plenty of room in, in the hearing aid to, to have those options available. Okay, thank you. There's a lot of ways to mix and match. <laughs> and it's hard for us to keep up with some of it sometimes, but <laughs> repetition helps us as well. All right, any other questions?
questions right now. We're going to move on to discussing something, a device for when hearing aids maybe are not helpful for somebody. But we want to make sure we got all the questions answered about hearing aids or testing right now. Oh, whoops, there's another slide. Sorry. So there are a lot of things to consider. <laughs> yes, there are. There are. Um, one, one of the things that people need to consider in purchasing a hearing aid is um, in getting a price. I know in the day, today's um, technology, a lot of people look at things online and, and compare cost. But one of the things that you need to keep in mind is what that charge includes. So um, the way we price the hearing aids here at Bident, there is a lot that is included in the price of the hearing aid. It's not just for the device itself. Um, it includes all of the professional service in doing the fitting, in doing the programming of the hearing aid, in counseling to be sure that you know how to put it in, take it out, take care of it, use any of the other options that come with the hearing aid. That is all included in the cost. Um, the warranty of the hearing aid is an important factor. You may be paying um, more for a hearing aid that has a three-year warranty versus a hearing aid that has a two-year or a one-year warranty. And here at Bident, the professional charges for our time um, it corresponds to that warranty. So if you have a three-year warranty, if you come in with a problem with the hearing aid, if the hearing aid isn't working, you're not charged a separate fee for us to look at the hearing aid and troubleshoot it um, while it's under warranty. So our professional service is, is tied into the warranty of the hearing aid um, that's offered through the manufacturer. I like to tell people that there it is it's not a small chunk of change, but all that money that you're paying quote for the hearing aid is you're paying up front for years of service and um, and yeah. support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also for um, certain things that come if you if depending on the style of, of the hearing aid, there may be um, certain items, uh, wax guards, domes that um, are also included for the, and that would be for the lifetime of the warranty. So, and questions, um, you know, people frequently call and, and ask questions and we're always open, open to that encourage, and encourage people to do that. We also offer, um, with our trial period, we offer a 30 day trial period. Now a trial period is something that, that is, um, something that is required by law. If for anyone that gets a hearing aid, they, um, law requires them to have a 30 day trial period. Um, some, a lot of facilities require you to pay for the hearing aids up front and then will reimburse you if at the end of the trial period, you decide not to proceed with purchase. Um, here at Vident, we offer a modest fitting fee of $65 um, per year. And that entitles you to a 30 day trial period where you are not under any obligation to put any other money towards the hearing aids until you decide that you're definitely going to purchase it. Um, we wanna be sure that you're, you're happy with the hearing aids and, and know how to use them and are using them appropriately um, before you invest the kind of money into them. And we wanna be sure that you're sure of the decision that you're making. Mm -hmm. As far as insurance coverage is concerned, that is something that is- Changing, changing all the time. All the Every time. single day. <laughs> it's evolving. We, we, can, we do not look into your insurance coverage and it's not because we don't want to, it's because that we can't keep up with the all of the policies that are available and we're not able to call on your behalf and, and ask because we don't, they're not the insurance companies who talk to us about um, a specific person's coverage. So that is something that I encourage people to call their insurance companies about and inquire about before their appointment. 
because not all coverage is the same. Um, some in some coverage will be for a certain amount. So some insurances may say we are, we're, you're able to get $1,500 um, per year to put towards hearing aids every three years. Um, other insurance companies may work differently where it's worked into the deductible of your actual insurance. Um, so each one is different and it may be something that is offered every three years or every five years for one year, for both years. There are so many variables that it's important that um, that's something that, that you check into. So you'll be able to make an informed decision and be able to take advantage of any possible coverage that you may have. You want to be able to take. You want to take advantage of it, and you can't take the complete full advantage if you don't know what it is. So we encourage people to call about that. Any questions? Um, we are not planning on talking about our pricing today, but I will say that we have a, a range of prices for hearing aids. Um, and that's something that we get into for patients when they come for a hearing aid consultation appointment. But the difference is that in the prices are, um, you know, kind of what Sandra said, what all is included and, um, you know, why one is better or not better than the other. So that is something that we don't have time to get into today because that can be a whole not like 30 minute conversation <laughs> by itself. Yes. Okay. I think that was the last hearing aid slide. Nope. Goodness gracious, let me see how many I have. Okay, this is the last one, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you fine, you fine. Okay, one of the things um, that I always tell patients to keep in mind is that unlike eyeglasses that are corrective, hearing aids are not corrective in nature and um, are, are not perfect. There is more of an adjustment that, that is required in getting used to hearing aids and there is to putting on glasses. You put glasses on and you say, oh wow, everything is so clear. You put mm -hmm. hearing aids on and you start hearing all of the noises that are going on. You say, oh, it's there's so a noisy. lot of noise going on around here. <laughs> so the initial um, reaction can, can be very different. And it takes not only our ears to hear, but also our brains to hear. So what do I mean by that? Well, over time, we adjust to putting certain sounds in the background and we have true listening skills where we, our brain puts certain sounds in the background so that we can pay attention to what it is that we want to listen to. And that's something um, that is learned over time. So um, hearing aids are, are not perfect and there's a certain amount of motivation that goes into um, getting used to the amplification, okay? And that's, that is part of the, the counseling that we provide our patients. On the other hand, hearing aids are far more automatic and sophisticated than they were many years ago when I started fitting <laughs> hearing aids. So they have a lot of nice features, um, which include the ability to reduce background noise, true background noise to a certain level, to try to put speech to the forefront. Um, and those are features that are kind of behind the scenes. You don't know that they're happening, um, but it is in the, in the working of the hearing aids now, which are basically com sophisticated computer chips in the hearing aids. And you'll find that, um, that like everything else that we have, phones and computers, that there are uh, improvements in the firmware and, and they can be updated in office. Um, the other thing is that two ears are, generally speaking, two ears are better than one. There are certain situations where that is not the case if there's a big difference between the ears, excuse me. <clears throat> but generally speaking, um, we have two ears for a reason, and that is because they work together in helping us hear better. Um, and generally our recommendation is for um, the, to both ears to be fit. Having said that, 
There are certain circumstances where the hearing in one ear is a lot worse than the other, or the ability to understand speech is a lot poorer in one ear than the other, or financially, it's not possible to buy two hearing aids at the same time. Um, then certainly one hearing aid is, is better than none. So two is better than one and mm -hmm. one is better than none. <laughs> and the other thing is, as Amy had said earlier in the presentation, hearing does not always mean understanding. There is a big difference between the ability to be able to hear a simple sound like a beep versus being able to understand speech, okay? Because speech is made up of a lot of sounds put together um, and we're somehow miraculously able to get meaning out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the two do not go hand in hand. And that's one of the things that we evaluate when we do the initial hearing tests so that we're able to provide realistic expectations um, when we get the hearing aids. Any questions about that? Yes, is there anything wrong with the hearing aid when a person is wearing it and you can hear it? That whistle sound, the feedback sound kind yes. of? Um, yes, there is something wrong because the years ago that was very, very common. You knew if you were in a crowd, you knew exactly who was wearing a hearing aid because that kind of um, what we call feedback, that whistling is a feedback back and um, there wasn't any way for the hearing aid to be able to handle it. But the hearing aids that are made now have um, the technology in them to self-correct. So a lot of times if we're hearing that feedback, it has to do with the way the hearing aid is sitting in the, in the person's ear. It may be that it's not in the ear properly it may be that there's something internally wrong with the hearing aid itself, um, or it may be that there's a lot of wax buildup in the ear canal. Um, but I would say that most commonly it has to do with the ear, with the earpiece mm -hmm. not being situated in the ear correctly. Yeah. I think that's something that a lot of people like hold on to, like their grandparents parents 20 or 30 years ago they had this big clunky hearing aid that would just squeal and whistle all the time and that's the only thing that sticks in their minds about hearing aids but um that's something that is relatively easy I guess I should, um for like us to fix and troubleshoot and to get to go away for people who wear hearing aids much easier than it was years ago years ago it was a it was a chronic chronic issue and it, it should not be um that big an issue um, at this point in time. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions right now? Okay. So this hearing does not always mean understanding bullet point is a good segue into the devices that I'm going to talk about. Sometimes hearing aids are not enough for some people or they have so much hearing loss where Sandra has mentioned they can hear some beeps but they're really not able to make sense out of people talking to them, even when it's loud enough. And in that case, something called a cochlear implant can be recommended. Um, it is a surgical device. And again, it's kind of a next step or a last resort for when hearing aids are just not cutting it for somebody. Um, it's a pretty big decision. There's a lot that goes into deciding if somebody is a candidate for a cochlear implant. There's a lot of testing. Um, definitely have to do some imaging like a CAT scan or an MRI that would be done when you meet with the physician with the surgeon. Um, and there's a lot of kind of counseling into what to expect um, before somebody makes this, you know, pretty big decision and um, just goes undergoes this surgery. As far as surgeries go, I surgeon has told surgeons have told me it's relatively cut and dry. It's pretty easy for the most part. Um, I am not the surgeon <laughs> at all, so that, you know, if you have questions about your medical concerns, if you have a heart condition or a bleeding disorder, you know, or anything like that, that would be a question for a physician or a surgeon, um, and I work pretty closely with the physician here in town. 
Um, there are three companies in the United States that manufacture cochlear implants. We are only working with two of them at Bident. Um, that's just kind of how it's been for many years, not to say that the third company is bad, because I know it's very popular at other hospitals. Um, but like for myself, I would rather be like very, very well trained on a couple devices than have only a little bit of training across more devices. So it's a little bit more specialized. Um, insurance does typically cover the cost, most of the cost of a cochlear implant, like the surgery and the device. Um, a lot of people who have a secondary insurance, that secondary insurance would cover like the, any type of remaining cost. So unlike hearing aids, as long as somebody qualifies with their testing for a cochlear implant, um, there's very little or no cost to the patient themselves um, to undergo the procedure. It is definitely not for everyone. It is not a quick fix. Like Sandra said, putting on eyeglasses is a pretty quick fix. Hearing aids, you know, take you know four to six weeks to adjust to on average. Cochlear implants, on the other hand, they can take up to a whole year to kind of get mm. to to um, improve in their performance. Um, so it's not. I mean, people have come in and asked for them, and I you know kind of shot them down just because I mean it's not appropriate. They don't know what they're getting into. And it, like I said, it's not for everybody, but it is a nice option for those who are kind of at their, at their last option. So there are two parts of a cochlear implant. The pictures here on the screen are the internal devices. So this is the piece that a surgeon would place during surgery. Patients usually never see this. It's not anything that's sticking out of your head in like a, I don't know, a bulge or anything. It's very flat. Um, this part is permanent. You can get a haircut. You can go swimming, you can take a shower, you can wear hats, it is fine. Um, so that's the internal devices, the implant. And then I do have some pictures on the next slide, I believe, of the external device, which is called a processor. Some of them look like giant hearing aids. Yeah, here we go. Um, and there's, they're magnetized. That's how it, the external device connects and talks to the internal device that's placed under your skin. Um, the surgery is not brain surgery. The device does not go anywhere near your brain. Um, there's tiny little electrode wire that gets inserted into your cochlea, which is kind of like your organ of hearing in your inner ear. Um, and this processor on the outside is what um, sends the sound, you know, picks up the sounds from your environment, um, collects them, turns them into electrical signals and then send it, sends it to the internal device, which then is able to kind of send um, messages and sound to your nerve of hearing, which carries it to the brain. Um, there are a couple of different styles. They come in all different colors. Some of the hearing aids now are waterproof. Um, so you can go swimming with them. That was not the case a couple of years ago. Um, the implant, I think I said hearing aids, but I meant implants or processor. Excuse me. Um, a lot of them now are also Bluetooth compatible, so you can connect them to phones or tablets or laptops and hear phone calls or music or anything directly through your implant. Um, they all have rechargeable batteries. Some have the option to use disposable, so like if your power goes out in a hurricane, you're still going to need to hear. Um, because once this external device comes off, the patient is going to be pretty deaf in that ear. They're really not going to be able to hear anything. Um, but that's kind of a lot of times that's how they were before they chose to have the surgery as well. So a lot that goes into it. They're a little, you know, pretty complicated, but for my patients who qualify for this procedure and choose to get the cochlear implant, I would say 99% of them are very pleased and happy with the outcomes after that initial adjustment period. So this is a little bit of a diagram we're kind of back to that cross-section of the ear with the internal implant and the external processor. And the cochlear implant can be used with a hearing aid on the other side. Yes, yep. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know anybody with a cochlear implant? No. All right, so I mentioned that a lot of the processors now have Bluetooth, um, much like the hearing aids. You can get a remote control app for your cell phone, so it's real easy to control volume or settings. There are accessories, just like hearing aid accessories that Ms. Sandra talked about. Uh, but something really important that 
anybody who gets a cochlear implant needs to do, especially within the first six to eight, maybe 10 months, is some listening exercises. It's called oral rehabilitation. Um, and that's beneficial even for patients with hearing aids um, who are wearing hearing aids, but we don't necessarily recommend it all the time. Um, but I mean, that you have to kind of train your brain and your ear to get used to the new way of hearing with a cochlear implant because at first it does not sound natural. It sounds different to everybody. I've had people say it sounds robotic. It sounds like Darth Vader or Mickey Mouse. I've heard people say there's a lot of static in the background. I've heard people say it sounds like bells and whistles. That's like all kind of first day reactions. And there's no way to predict what it's gonna sound like at first for anybody. There's no way to predict how well somebody is gonna do with the implant over time. Um, but if somebody's working with me and they do all the homework that I assign them, um, they have a pretty good chance of hearing and understanding a lot better than they were before they got the device. Um, and again, like I had mentioned, it is not perfect, just like hearing aids, it takes time to adjust to the device, to the sound, and to improve their listening and hearing skills and understanding. Questions about cochlear implants? Or anything else that we had talked about so far? We're almost done. All right, so some communication tips that we wanted to pass along to y'all um, for people, I mean, with or without hearing loss, face-to-face -face communication is always the best and it's gonna ensure um, the best like kind of understanding and communication of your message. People with hearing loss and even without lip read, whether they know it or not. Um, so without a mask, if possible, which is not obviously not always possible during the COVID times, um, but face-to-face -face communication is gonna be your best bet for sure. You can reduce or eliminate background noise and distractions. So if you're trying to talk to your spouse at home and your spouse is watching TV in the living room and you're doing dishes in the kitchen, um, that's a lot of noise and a lot of distance and you should not expect to be able to understand what the other person is saying across those two rooms. Um, especially if when you know houses have real high ceilings kind of an open floor plan um, and with like hardwood floors. Um, that's, I mean, there's so many things that you can't control with your house, but muting the TV for a second or walking into the next room is definitely something easy to do. And that's, and that even if someone is fit with a hearing aid, this is something that I tell them to, to do. So it's something, um, these tips are for people that um, do have hearing loss and don't have hearing aids, but they continue to apply when you, um, even when you wear hearing aids. It also applies to my husband who has perfectly normal <laughs> hearing and just chooses to ignore me. <laughs> I think that's a husband issue. Um, sometimes speaking a bit slower than your normal rate of speech will be helpful. Um, and if you need to repeat or rephrase to so say something in a different way for somebody to understand, um, or if you yourself are struggling understanding what someone is saying, if you could you know, ask that person to repeat maybe say it in a different way, or even slow down a little bit, look at me, you know, all these things. You kind of have to be your own self-advocate if you're struggling. People don't, people, if you're struggling, people don't know what you need. So it's important that you help them because they, if they're talking to you, they, they want to communicate with you. They want, they don't want you to be left out um, and they just may not know what to do. So I always encourage people to let people know what it is that they need. Um, I'm not here I'm understanding that word. Can you rephrase it, put it in a different way? Um, you're speaking a little too fast. Can you speak slower? If you're somewhere in a group situation um, and you're having, you have difficulty hearing, if you're with a, a spouse, you may, um, or a good friend, you may ask them to let you know if the topic of conversation shifts so that you can get cues from what the, the subject matter is. These are all things that um, people can be proactive and, and do to, to help themselves. And I think that most of the time, if you tell someone what it is that you need, they're going to be receptive to that. They just, they get frustrated as well if um, they're not being, not able to get their point across. Um, preferential seating is, a, is another big thing. 
If you're um, you know, going somewhere, you want to sit as close as possible to the person that you want to, to hear, um, not sit all the way in the back where there may be dishes and um, a lot of clattering going on. You want to seat yourself in a, in a way that is going to give you the best, um, the best hearing. And again, that little message pops out. Louder does not always mean more clear. Yeah. True. All right. So we are open to any additional questions that y'all may have. Um, if you think of anything later, um, you're welcome to call us. Um, phone number is on the screen for you. To be seen here at Vidant, um, to be seen by me or Miss Sandra or in any of our coworkers are fabulous. We love everybody who we work with. Um, we will need a referral from your primary care physician. That's regardless of what type of insurance you have. It is a hospital policy. Um, we can get the referral for you. Um, you just have to call us and say, you know, I want to make an appointment. Tell us who your doctor is and we can work on it for you. Um, we can bill insurance for your testing. Most of the time testing is covered by insurance. Um, but like Ms. Sandra said, if you're interested in hearing aids, definitely call your own personal plans to see if they offer any support. And then like we had mentioned, our recommendations are individual based on whatever test results we find for a patient. So it is definitely not one size fits all. Um, but we have enjoyed talking to y'all this morning. Like I said, this was our first kind of Zoom presentation. Um, if you have friends or family members who are in, you know, this type of group elsewhere, um, we'd be happy for you to pass our information along to either give a presentation or, you know, if you feel like your spouse needs to come in for a hearing test, give them our phone number. We can talk to them. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I have one last question. Mm -hmm. Can you give us the um, a range of, for the cost for the testing? Um, I don't know the testing off the top of my head. Yeah, Do I don't, I I don't know. Either. Sorry, that's something I would have to look up and I can get back to you if you'd like. Okay. Yeah. I just know that I get all the time on my email, unfortunately, and in the mail that uh, you can come in for a free hearing test. Right. Yeah, um, we don't offer those here. I knew a lot of um, places like Belltown or, um, I mean, whatever the other places are called, they do offer that. Um, that's trying to kind of get you in the door, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, we're not gonna get into marketing strategies, but um, like I said, we would bill your insurance for the test and most of the time it is covered pretty well. Okay. One of the things to keep in mind is that, you know, we, we are employed by the hospital so that we have nothing to, to gain or to lose, whether someone comes in and purchases a hearing aid or not, whereas um, other facilities that may offer the free hearing tests, um, somewhere along the line, their time is going to be, they're covering for their time, um, and it may be, may be you know, included in the price, ultimately in, included in the price of the hearing aid, but that is what their main focus is, whereas our main focus here at the hospital is not selling hearing aids. It's providing service. Not that other people don't provide service, but we don't have anything to gain or, or lose. Yeah from the purchase of hearing aids. Um, and also something to keep in mind, Sandra and myself and our coworkers, we are all audiologists, whereas some um, offices or companies, they may employ what are called like just hearing instrument specialists. Um, we went to a lot of school <laughs> um, to be able to become audiologists and hearing instrument specialists. I mean, you can study and take the test as a 18 year old right out of high school. Um, so it would be, it, even if you don't come to Vidant, if you are looking for a hearing test or hearing aids, we would recommend that you seek out somebody who is an actual audiologist in, instead of just a hearing aid dispenser or mm -hmm. like specialist or fitter. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Again, thank you, um, Amy and Sandra. Yeah, and if like I said, if anything pops up later, feel free to call us or um, Judy, you can share my email address with whoever may want it, okay? 
All right. Thank you very much. Thank we you. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a good evening or afternoon, evening. I don't yes. know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the two of you. Bye. Oh, Miss Amy. Yes, sir. Uh, you must not be following one of your communication tips. Get the person attention. You don't get your husband attention first. No, I do. I have to. <laughs> I, communication. I do it at my house. <laughs> Good one. Thank you, guys. Okay, then. All right. Thank you again. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, Reverend Faircloth, would you lead us in prayer, for ending prayer, please? And All could right. you pray again for Van and his son? She is on with us today. I didn't hear the name for who? Van Henderson. All right. Thank you. She was on, but she may have left. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for what we've heard. And we thank you, God, for all that's available to us. We pray, oh God, for the seniors because they are the ones who may need this hearing aid. We thank you for the person that left early. We thank you that she was able to be with us for a short time. The information was good. And we pray for safety as we go to and forth, traveling back and forth. Certainly safety in the home and the hearing aids would be a great device if we need it concerning noises, any noises inside, outside, whatever. We bless you and we thank you again for the presentation in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. And our last song for today is, I Have a Father Who Can. I cannot make a word and hold it in my hand. Cannot take the lightning. Flash it across the land. Cannot take a piece of clay and mold it into man. But I have a father. I have a father. A father who can. Well, now. I cannot take a cloud. Send it in the sky. Cannot love humanity so much that I would die. I cannot name the stars above or count. The grains of sand, but I have a father. I have a father, a father who came. <laughs> Somebody help me say, He sits high. He sits high. And look low. Feet. Guide my feet. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. And mm -hmm. I hope the rest of your day is blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for inviting us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for thank okay. you for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Have a good day. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Okay now. Bye bye, bye now. Bye.